Standby like use 2 through 33, sound 1A through 7 on deck. Standby Q actors. Electrics, kill the blue run lights, please. Like you 2 and sound 1A. Go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hang and Focus Live. I'm your host, Sean Daniels. Thank you all so much for being with us today uh, and every Friday here at 4. So today is Juneteenth, and we're going to definitely talk about that a significant bit. But uh, one thing I wanted to make you just aware of, if after the end of this show you feel like you want more and you want to be able to spend some more time with the fantastic artists of Arizona Theater Company. Uh, for those of you that saw the Royale at the beginning of our season written by Marco Ramirez, uh, Bashir Sylvain, who was the lead actor in that, is actually starring in a reading called The Meeting, which is an imagined interaction between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. It's 5.30 Pacific time and it is, you can get tickets. There's a link that we posted yesterday. Our team is gonna go ahead and post it in the chat here for you to be able to find. It doesn't cost anything, but you do have to register to be able to watch the link. And after you register, you're gonna see a list of organizations that you could donate to, to be able to support the Black Lives Matter movement or other organizations that the people putting the reading together felt like was important. So a great way to get some fantastic theater on today to support an Arizona artist and to be able to support so many fantastic causes that uh, we all need to be thinking about and most importantly, donating to. So go ahead and check that out in the link afterwards and uh, get to watch the show at 5.30 Pacific. All right, let me go ahead and bring on my co-host, Carly Preston, uh, who is joining us here. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Good. So uh, I just wanted to, today is Juneteenth. Uh, yes. And so I wanted to just take a moment to make sure that we acknowledge that, to be able to talk about it. Um, I also just want to talk about when we learned about this. Now, because of course, uh, it has been around for some time. As someone who went to public school in Arizona, I can tell you that I'm pretty sure I never uh, heard of this holiday. And um, I'm in fact just learning more about it now. Is that the same case for you? Yes, going to Arizona schools, um, I found out about it last year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> real, real. Real great. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in my school, it was like, you know, oh, the Civil War ended uh, and everybody was free and then it was good, <laughs> you yeah. know? So yeah, last year, guilty, but yeah. um, definitely did a lot of research and, and, and happy, happy to know about it and celebrate it. You know what I think, it's, it's sometimes hard for me to clock what is progress in these conversations. And I yeah. think, you know, the city of Tempe named it a holiday, right? Oh, and and that, for someone that knew Tempe in the 80s, I, I would not have guessed that's how it would have gone. Yeah. And so yeah. I think for all of us to be talking about it, the governor of Arizona came out today, mentioning it that it's today. And so uh, it does feel like in small ways, right? Like at least yeah. we are more aware of the history of what Definitely. is. Definitely, yeah, I, it, yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people now are are hearing about it or learning about it. Um, but it's also, it's like interesting, right? Cause it's, it's this celebration. This is the 155th year of, of Juneteenth. Um, and it feels with everything that's going on, like how far have we actually come, you know? So it's that mix of like celebratory and acknowledging what happened in the past, but then dealing with everything that's going on now. But it's great to see people of all walks of life, just learning, learning our history. Yeah. Uh, your, your take uh, should be a national holiday should be a day off work. I mean, yes. I know everyone thinks everything should be a day off work, but should well, it, right. it yeah. I mean, and I had a day off today. Um, okay. There but you yeah, go. yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we have 4th of July, which is our independence day, but it was not the independence day for black Americans. So absolutely Juneteenth should be a national holiday. Okay. All right. I declare it. <laughs> I know. That's... I, I wish I had that power. <laughs> we have a lot of followers on the show. So somebody yeah. out there could help us to get that. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, um, I, I just, I'm glad that we're able to acknowledge it. I hope that people are able to watch Bashir's yeah. reading or oh, just to yeah, figure absolutely. out like how for themselves can they really honor this, right? For sure. For and... sure. There's a lot of celebrations in communities all over. I know with COVID, 
it's difficult. Um, so, I mean, I would say if you want to celebrate, just go support a black owned business, you know, go get some amazing barbecue or something. There's a lot of them around that are black owned and just support that way if you don't feel comfortable being in a huge group of people. Right. I mean, retail therapy is a thing, yes, right? So why yes. not take today, do some good retail therapy and uh, support, yeah. right? Yeah. Local black businesses in whatever right. city it is that you're watching this. Absolutely. Time. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you know, what's great. I feel like with all the um, awareness that's now going on, you can Google black owned businesses and it asks you, do you mean near me? You can say yes. Yeah. Uh, and actually, if you want to go on, uh, Tucson Foodie even has a list that you can go check out, right? If you're in Tucson of local black businesses. Yeah. Uh, we'll try to find that and we'll post that in the chat afterwards for people to be able to. And find. since we're since we're talking about it, I'm not I'm not connected. I just want to do a plug. Blacks Friday, B-L-A-X. They just launched an app on uh, the Apple Store. Um, and it is a list and map of all the black owned businesses in Tucson. Um, so check that out too, Miss Ashley LaRussa of Rue Events. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so congratulations, yeah. Ashley, if you're, if you're watching, but yeah, check that out. She's going to be a guest in a couple weeks, so I, I, I hope that yeah. she is watching. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, we have two fantastic guests for us today to be able to talk it. We have Joni Drago, who is the playwright of Hot Pink or Ready to Blow and many other things, and Oscar De La Salas, who is a... He's everywhere in Phoenix. If you've been to a place in Phoenix, he was probably there with you. And the terms. most fashionable. I know. And we need to Ooh. talk about like a good lesson and like the first thing in looking good is making sure your clothes fit, right? Somehow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, he, he is also a COVID survivor and so very vocal and getting, you know, about the new mask ordinance that was passed today yeah. in Phoenix. So we get a chance to talk to him about that and just his thoughts on, yeah. on how it came together. Um, but first, let's bring out Joni Drago to the show. Um, Joni is a, a, a one of my favorite playwrights. And uh, I just think is a, a voice that is incredibly important in the American theater and elsewhere. So let's go ahead and welcome Joni Drago to the show. She'll be here momentarily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We can say other- this is uh, live theater folks right here, right it now. It is, yeah, <laughs> to be able to do it. Um, so while she's waiting, so one thing, and you know, we all know that everything is a little bit, oh, oh, hello. There she is. Yeah. Oh, I think you're oh, unmuted. Uh, I think. Unmuted. Oh, I'm muted. I'm muted in my videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This way for you guys. Hi, how are you? I'm I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. <laughs> um, so, uh, little known fact: you are a you were a daytime talk show host until this past week, and then now you have a nighttime show. You know, tell tell us the story. Yeah, Sean. You know everything is everything. You know, for a, the real story is for a long time I thought I was a playwright, and then I realized I just knew how to run my mouth and set it down on, on paper. And um, well, now I think it's a whole lot easier to just run my mouth. And um, so when the pandemic started, uh, my friends and I, we had started building kind of this infrastructure, like let's start doing a live stream or something like that. And then when the pandemic happened, it was like, oh, we have all this time now and everybody has all this time now. And um, now we make a daily talk show from 10.30 a.m. to noon Monday through Friday. And we just, you know, it was an improvised call-in comedy show. And, um, you know, I think something we together, we made like a hundred, a hundred hours of TV between my, my director, Tom, and my executive producer, Octavia Leona Koner. We made something like a hundred hours of TV. And then it just, you know, right now it's like, um, we got kind of burned out. That's a lot to do. You know, it's a big daily practice. And, um, we were kind of trying to figure out what's next. And it seems like, you know, the cultural conversation is, you know, also really shifting away from what kind of sourdough starters do we want to try this week? You know, I think things have really changed <laughs> and, um, you know, for all the right reasons. And so, you know, similarly, we were trying to figure out how can our priorities shift to, to accommodate kind of what everybody's thinking and what everybody needs right now. And, 
our goal always was, you know, how can we, we be a bright spot of sunshine in people's days during a really hard time? And I think we can still do that. So, um, you know, in this time of transition and learning so much about myself and, you know, as we're learning so much about the world around us and um, our fellow human beings, um, something that I realized was that I'm not cut out to be a daytime host. I'm meant to be a late night host, John Daniels. Well, you know, we all have discoveries about ourselves and I'm glad that you made that one because that really feels like an important one for going forward. You know, now, people, I knew there was something about me that people couldn't put my finger on. <laughs> <laughs> now, you don't you don't consider yourself a playwright, but you did write a play, Hot oh. Pink or Ready to Blow. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Oh gosh, and I say that all very flippantly. I'm a playwright. I'm just I'm a theater <laughs> person no matter what I end up doing, right? Yeah. Um, and a few years back in Atlanta, I got real I was really lucky to be able to make a play with my friends Veronica Durr and um, the Weird Sisters Project. And, um, <clears throat> oh, I think, am I here? Oh, I just- You are, you're here. Yeah. Yeah. Out for a second. Oh, I like, I moved out for a second. Um, I got to make this play where we really investigated um, what it was like to be a teenage girl and what it was like to be, um, to me and what it meant to sort of become um, aware of your body and the way that men look at your body at this very tender age. And, um, you know, at the time I thought, uh, why am I the only man in the room? Or like, why am I invited to this thing? And it's all women, it's all women in this process. And now I see um, that it wasn't. And, um, and now I see, um, now I'm really curious to see another production of this play uh, where, we, where it's clear that the playwright was female. You know what I mean? It's a big change, Sean, from the way this play was made, and you know that, you know? Yeah, but it, it's happened in Atlanta, and then it happened in Chicago, is that correct? Yeah, it got, yeah, we got, we, we, we had this incredible run in Atlanta, and people just went crazy, and it was so, it was just really, really exciting, and then um, maybe like a year or two later, it got um, my friends in Chicago um, at the New American Folk Theater, they produced it, um, and it was a very different time, right? Because at the, in the time in between, really like the Me Too movement had happened and even like the Pussy Hats and the Women's March and like literally all of that stuff happened after we made Hot Pink. And to see it then a couple years later in Chicago and um, you know, there's a part in the play where they may, they have these buttons that's like that says huge slut. It's like a badge of honor to be called a huge slut in the play. And um, there were people who, when I, I came to see the play on its closing weekend, and there were people who had come again and again, and they were wearing their slut buttons. And they, it was really a different at atmosphere where people wanted to like celebrate these characters in a really different way. And so now it's like two years later, I can't wait to find out what it looks like now. Well, and for people that don't know, so we are doing this as a co-production between us and the University of Arizona theater program, right? Which is yeah. a big step forward for them using students, right? So to try to actually empower, you know, these young women that are in the school to be a part of a play that is dealing with them as opposed to them having pretending to be, you know, on a Scottish moor somewhere to really actually be able to deal with the issues that they face in their own life. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's like the play, um, it starts out about, um, it's a play about virgin sacrifice and a volcano sacrifice. And it starts out a play about um, who help, who help who's gonna save us. And then it turns out to be a play about three best friends who help save each other, you know? And they help transform each other. And um, it becomes really just a play about friendship, you know, in a really powerful way that I think resonates with students of that like college age you know yeah now you you uh veronica durr who was your director is going to direct it again um oh she and i go way back sean you know that i do i do i do she, she's asleep with my daughter upstairs right now so I, you know yeah <laughs> I've, I've seen that nursery sean <laughs> um so what, so what, I mean, how do you think it'll resonate differently now in terms of, yeah, because all, all great theater, right, feels like it is of the moment, right? Like yeah. things that are museum pieces, I think never 
we never really respond to, right? Like you want a, you want a text that feels like, oh my God, I can't believe this play wasn't written this afternoon, which I feel yeah. like is what will be the case with yours. So how do you, how do you think it will be different now? You know, I'm not really sure. I think, you know, there's something about the ending of this play, you know, the ending of this play, they blast off into the future, you know, however many thousands of years into the future. And the, it's really a question about like, how do we leave a mark? Right? What does it mean to be alive? How will anybody know that we were ever here? And how will anybody ever know that our lives at least felt important at the time, you know? And, um, and I think that that, uh, I think that there's something about, I think that there's something about this idea of like leaving a legacy or um, uh, I think something about that feels really important now and resonant right now. I, when I wrote the play too, I was thinking a lot about do you know the end of Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Did you watch the whole show at the I, end? And, and I love the ending where like <laughs> girls all across the world get the power of Buffy, right? Yeah, yeah there's like a girl all... playing softball that gets like better posture, right? Yeah. 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 I'll cry, I'll cry sitting here thinking, you know what I mean? I'll cry. But, but we really, I felt like we really approached the ending of that play and I really wanted there to be something about this play that's about like giving away this power to all girls to befriend each other. And, um, Geez, I hope that's the message of it today. And for these college girls, you know, these young women who get to perform these roles. Yeah. It's all about friendship, you know, and making art. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, can we talk about your favorite writer, J.K. Rowling, for a brief moment? Oh, God. <laughs> you, want on, you want me to put on the tap shoes, Sean? <laughs> I can do that if you need me to. Uh, I, no, my great, no, the, the, the huge, uh, the way I've got J.K. Rowling uh, is that I never cared. I don't know a thing about Harry Potter. I never cared. It came out when I was already like in college or maybe grad school even. And I was just like, that's for children. Those are children's books. I never have, I've never seen it. I've never read, a, I don't know the movies. I don't know. I know Daniel Radcliffe played in Equus. I know Daniel Radcliffe was in Equus on Broadway. <laughs> That's as much about Harry Potter as I know, is that Daniel Radcliffe was Equus on Broadway or something, right? He like blinded he was, a horse. He yeah, he did, yeah. And, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, that's so funny. And uh, I, you know, I just, I, I just, my, my big like vengeance is that I know nothing about. I know nothing about that person, right? So um, I know that um, I know that the turfs that I know that, that's trans exclusionary radical feminists. Um, these are frequently um, frequently cisgender women who um, use biology as a way to um, uh, recriminate or intimidate um, trans women. Um, I know that the turfs that I know in my life um, seem to really be doing it out of a place of pain and looking for someone to um, to kick. You know what I mean? You get beat up at work and you go home and you wanna go home and you kick the dog. You look for the dog to kick and you kick the dog. And for whatever reason, I don't know, JK Rowling has this thing in her head where trans women are the dog she wants to kick. Some people, I don't know, you just gotta go look at a different, go get a different dog, Sean. I don't know, you gotta go save the dog and go read somebody else's children's books, right? There's a world of children's books out there, Sean. Have, have you and Veronica started writing children's books yet? <laughs> we have not, but that that could be in the near future for us to be able. I mean, you read some of these and you're like, we've got to get into this, yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. So what what so what is next for you? Is it just your nighttime show? Is it you're in New York, right? So how how is it being in New York? I'm it's it's been really strange because I'm I've been cooped up here in Flatbush, you know, around my apartment for the last three and a half, you know, this whole time I've been, you know, so New York City as it was just hasn't been available to me or it hasn't existed really in the way New York City is a thing, right? So it's really just kind of been me and my friends in my apartment and. Um, you know, this whole pandemic and everything is really reprioritized. You know, just, I was, my, I felt like my whole career up to this certain point was like chasing these awards and these developments and these workshops, you know, this, these like measurements, right? Of how I was successful or not successful and how much I loved myself or didn't love myself as a result of these, like these things that could be put on a one page CV that said my name at the top in a larger font than all the other font. <laughs> and you know, those things felt so important. 
And what feels really important to me right now is like, can I take care of my friends? Can I make my friends laugh? And, um, you know, is it possible to, um, to feed myself and feed my friends and take care of this little cat I just adopted? And, oh. um, and sometimes go live on Facebook on Thursday nights and try to make some comedy too. You know, I bet I could do it all. Oh, Sean. Yeah. So you are, you are in the comedy scene though, also in New York, correct? Yeah, I was. I was in the. I was. I was on one of the uh, characters teams at Upright Citizens Brigade, just for the last sort of the last cycle before the world shut down, and then just a little part of another cycle. Um, and I got to do a lot of really fun stuff and meet a lot of really fun people that way. Did that change who you are as a playwright or who you are as a person to be, you know, to discover comedy in that way? Yeah, I. I mean, I really. What I what I was in what I was going in search of was like um, well I was a playwright who already who always wrote comedy I always wrote satire and um, but then I was you know my life kind of fell apart at another point and then I was like in this reinvention of myself I need to um, I'm going to study what it means what comedy is right what is my question became what is one unit of funny and um, and in that investigation what I found was um, clown and improv and something that UCB calls the game, which is sometimes useful and sometimes not useful. Um, what I found were all of these frameworks that just pointed me back to myself. You know what I mean? So I think my when I was a playwright, it was me seeking out in a way, um, wanting out, if that makes sense, like reaching yeah. out, wanting things from outside. And I think something, you know, something that I've actually learned from all of that was just the value of myself and like myself as a performer, I make my own work, I perform, I perform my work and the value of, I think the value of myself is what this whole thing has, has brought me back to again and again. And, the, and I thank the pandemic for that. I thank it. You know, it, 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 I think we all deal with this, where it's like, if there aren't awards to be won and shows to be, you know, got, and if it's not, if Facebook isn't just a like list of like, who's humble bragging that day, like, yeah. who, who are we as artists and how do we take care of each other? And what is our community? You yeah. know, at, at a moment that like, it, it is equalized right across the board. Like no, yeah. no one is making theater today. Yeah. Right. Well, it's like, I, um, you know, when I really, when I, when I said like, okay, I don't want to write plays anymore. This hurts my feelings too bad. You know what I mean? The system and the submissions and all that, it just hurts so bad after so long. And I really said, okay, no more. I'm not going to write any new plays. I'm going to see out all these like obligations that I have or all these other, these like collaborative relationships, these projects in process. I'll see all of those out and then I'll kind of see how I feel. And you know, Veronica Durr, who I made Hot Pink with, she just kept nagging me about that play we started writing and this thing we started writing and this thing about this dominatrix and she just never let it go. And, um, you know, I took, that was a partnership that for some, for sometimes I took for granted in my life, you know, but now I look back and that Veronica and you, Sean, and that play and that um, getting to go to Edinburgh and all that was a real lifeline for me. And I'll thank you for it forever. Yeah, uh, we uh, so for people that don't know, we the three of us all went to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. We had a stupid trip together. It was so dumb. I'm still crying about it a year later. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, and you know the festival's not even happening this year, right? So we yeah, actually went to the last Edinburgh Fringe Festival. We tore it down, Sean. We did <laughs> after <laughs> us. They yeah. could never happen again after we left. <laughs> um, so we ask every guest to bring a word on with them to be able to, to talk about. Do you have a, a word for us today? A word? Yes. I didn't have to write it down or anything. You, no, you can just tell us, yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to use the word uh, explosion. Uh, <laughs> I... Uh, I have lots and lots of like uh, balloons and things like that and things that are ready to kind of pop at all times all around me, see? And, um, and I'm ready or to the talk- show or just like normally? Just in general. Oh, just normally in my life. I have a lot of like, <laughs> delicate things and a lot of sharp pointy things all around me. Yeah, that's totally, that's totally true. So the word is explosion. What do you need from me? 
Well, I guess why you chose that word. Oh, um, um, yeah, I guess, I, well, I guess it's funny because I think um, I've been thinking a lot about like the big bang theory lately in some ways or like, um, what is like the starting point of like the self, right? I, can, I mean, it's clear like a lot of the work that I'm doing is, has to do with like um, the starting point of the self in a way, right? And how, what it means to be, um, what it means to be an artist, right? And I think the thing that I keep coming back to is like, um, like, uh, like if I'm to, if I were to say I am, right? I am. There's an idea, there's creativity in that, right? There's already this like potential in that. There's this energy, there's this creative flow, right? So just to say I am, I think is, is a creative process, you know? And, um, and I think that it's this idea of explosion is like going outward, 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 right? How can we, um, how can I use myself and create something outward and give it to the world and pass on something, I don't know, bigger, better than before. I mean, I think for all of us on some level, right? You do theater because you feel like you have something that you feel like should be shared, right? Like if it's, if it was just selfish, it's like, it's too hard of a career to just, like there's, there's easier ways to be selfish than to, to get into <laughs> performing arts, yeah. And try to convince 400 people that they want to even read your script. Yeah. Oh, Sean. Oh, it's a rough one out there. Oh, it's so hard, Sean. <laughs> uh, so uh, our time is almost up, but how can people watch your show? How can they find more of you? Sean, thank you so much for helping. Thank you so much for being on here. Let me letting me ramble on and on about myself. And my oh, of course, of course. Uh, no, but where, how can they see your show? You can see me at uh, Hangout with Joni Drago on Facebook. All right. Love it. Just follow Hangout with Joni Drago. That's the page. Love That's it. excellent. Thank you so much for being on the okay. show. It's Thank always you. wonderful You're to see you. A joy, okay. an absolute so joy. Much. Thank um, you. Okay, bye everybody. Bye. <laughs> no, I don't know how to turn this off. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel like we should all have just balloons around us at every moment. I love it. Moment I was sort of hoping she would pop something or, but yeah, I, or I just. <laughs> Like the uh, just light, light is what I you know, the background and she was great, just so fun and but that inner the looking into yourself and coming from there was I was just completely sucked in, which is why I was so silent, just like no. to say more, yeah. Well, and great. you know, I think uh, what was exciting for us when we talked to University of Arizona about doing a show is that I think the majority of their playwrights are kind of like dead white guys, right? Or very yeah. like classics, oh, yeah. you know, Shaw, yeah, yeah. Chekhov, you oh, know, yeah. all those things. Absolutely. So it's like, oh, here, here is someone who will be unlike those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something- and Come in and, you know, what is it to have a playwright in the room? Right, yeah, right? but something fresh and relevant. I mean, you know, when I went through that program, I was always in like the old lady sweater shows, you know? So, you know, <laughs> being able to do something, uh, with that type of material yeah, is awesome. That's great. You know, and I think it's a real compliment to Hank Stratton who is in his, uh, just finished up his first year or second year, right? In terms of yeah. running that theater program that really yeah. like he wants to bring different types of artists into work with the, you know, with the, the young adults that are there. So it's fabulous. Yeah, no, Yay. it definitely feels like a, a moment, right? In Arizona where it's like, oh, we are we are collecting all the good ones. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Arizona is the place to be. I mean, yes. minus the COVID, but. Um. <laughs> that's right, if, if you stay inside and wear a mask. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Here's the destination. Um, that's right. Speaking of the COVID, let's go ahead and bring out our great friend, uh, Oscar De La Salas, who is uh, an amazing community organizer and is really the best dressed man in Phoenix. So Oscar, go ahead and come on out whenever Maybe you- Maybe the state. Oh my God, yeah, by far yeah. the state. Yeah. Oh. oh. Oh, we're on mute. Oh, everybody starts on mute. I know. There you go, hello technology. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. You're, you're sideways too. Is there a oh, way to- it's Welcome to my sideway life. There Maybe we go. That's right. Yeah. Now I am. How are you guys? We are good. Good, are how good. are you? Feeling better, little by little, day by day. Yeah. That's um, the way life is for me now. 
Yeah. Before before we get into that, I just want people to know, I, like, I'm such a fan of you because I feel like few people support culture in Arizona, particularly in Phoenix, like you. I, I, I mean, I used to joke that like every morning after event, you must have to select what is the next event you are hosting because you are <laughs> you are always hosting an event. Yeah. Well, that's my passion for this community and for this town. I moved here 22 years ago, just on my own with four. Uh, suitcases. I, I didn't know many people. I just actually knew one person. And then I supposed to be just writing my thesis project about Talias in West. I'm an architect. And then I was heading back to Spain uh, when I came from, from Madrid. And uh, the six months uh, became a year. And then I had to ask for an extension of my uh, thesis and slowly became 22 years later. And I um, I made a community here, I found my husband, um, and then I love this town, and I think um, having a voice uh, and allowing to use that voice towards uh, community uh, impacting type of, uh, of movements and more so arts, I think that's what I place myself. And thank you so much for your words. Oh my God, I mean, but you do everything, right? Like I think I was at the Scottsdale Arts you know, gala, and that was you. And then I was at the Big Brothers Big Sisters gala, and that was you. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure there will be like a COVID relief fund, and that will also be you, yeah. right? That Which is going to happen, actually. Believe it or not, for my birthday, uh, my birthday's coming up by the end of the month. It's the uh, 29th. I happen to be, um, it's been today three months in confinement. I, we'll talk about it in a minute. But um, yeah, so then Escazal Arts, uh, Starry Night, I was the chairman of that. Then my husband and I, Gary, co-chair uh, with Paul Penson and Veronica Penson, Sheriff Paul Penson and his wife, we co-chair Big Brothers Big Sisters and saw other things that I was doing with the community. Uh, I used my talents toward the community. And then um, I just felt that for my birthday, I just didn't want to like, throw a celebration or something like that, like I do every year. So I'm open my, my, my birthday celebration to have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with Congressman uh, Greg Stanton. And I'm going to telecast it the same way you guys are doing it. And I'm gonna, we're gonna have, go through several questions the community wants to ask. So that's my voice. And I'm offering my birthday on a Facebook Live. Let me just peel, uh, let me pull it that in. Sunday, uh, June 28th at 5.30 on my Facebook Live. It's gonna be a 5 p.m. Facebook Live. So yeah, that's the voice. Yeah, let's, no, we're all about the hype. You can drop as many things yes. in here that yeah. you want. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just can't so, imagine. So you have so let's so let's talk about it. You have kind of an amazing story of how of how you got ill with this, right? You're you're at a because you're with your husband and he doesn't get sick, right? Correct. He he had two he had two days that he felt a little feverish or four days, a little clammy, feverish, um, not that well. And I was actually through the process. So my diagnose is uh, I am presum presumptive of, of having having viral no, having COVID, and it's a viral pneumonia. That's my diagnosis of viral pneumonia. But it was presumptive of COVID. The reason being is because I was one of the first people in town to have some sort of symptoms similar to COVID, and they didn't have the testing. I didn't qualify for the testing. It was only for healthcare uh, workers or someone who had 14 days out of town, or so, like there were two or three things and I didn't qualify. So but I was already sick. I was already sick. So they uh, gave me x-rays and then on the x-rays uh, show up that I have a, a viral pneumonia, uh, bilateral, means the two, my two lungs, but uh, pneumonia. And I've been battling that since March 31st. Do you, and do you know when you or how you got it? Like, do you know what night? I think I just, I have to write a movie and I'm looking for a writer <laughs> I wonder who that would be, a producer, so, <laughs> and an actress. So, <laughs> so I am at the Phoenix, like you said, we're very connected and very uh, uh, in the community, helping several uh, nonprofits in the world of arts. So we went to the Arizona Opera, and I believe, I, don't, I can't remember if it was ballet, I think it was ballet, Gary, oh, Gary's upstairs, or we went to see the opera. So listen to this i'm in the lobby having a glass of champagne and i'm with gary my husband uh we get a lady come towards us i mean we get a lot of people come to us to like talk to us during uh, uh these intermissions and so on so i had my glass gary's decide 
this lady comes with another girlfriend. The lady comes to say hello and start talking to Gary. Someone else come on the other side and talk to Gary. Gary had like three people with him. And then she turned around and introduced me, this lady who came from New York uh, about just for a week. And then when she was introducing to her, the lady coughs on her hand. And then I ha already have my hand extended and it's this low motion of the hand. I was like, what do I do? Pull it back or <laughs> give the hand? So I kept my hand there. And then I'm like, she gave me the hand and I'm just, just okay, nothing happened. I, because we didn't know. We were not as, um, how do I say this? Um, as careful as we are today or as, as we know, a, a precautious as we are today. So I took the glass, I took the hand, grabbed the glass, that took a sip, I dabbed my lips, then I just, Keep walk, kept walking, pull my lip balm, turn around, touch my face, got my glasses, and I'm telling you, that's the low. That I think that's what I, that's how I got it. The lady came from New York only for the weekend, and she was leaving, going back to Europe. But I can't remember who it is. That's the famous tracing. I cannot remember who that person is, so I can call her to like. So anyway, you know what I would tell her. But anyway, that's what happened, and I know it was involuntary. She had it, but I think that's that's how I caught it. So I guess the question that we all have is like, what does it feel like to get it? And what does it feel like in those early days? And, and were you scared? Because I think, especially when you had it right in March, we knew so little about what it was right. or really, you know, what, how it would progress. So March 15th, if I tell you, I even, I even have a diary, I have a log. On March 15th, I started to feel just clammy. The office, I worked for a multi, multinational company and then all our offices went into work from home mode, everybody. 6,000 employees in less than 48 hours. Gensler, the company that I work for, uh, uh, I do project management for them, project management for them. They sent us home. So everybody in 48 hours went from home. So it comes that, I think it was Monday, and I started sweating. I couldn't, I, like my joints hurt. I was exhausted. I didn't feel like, like I didn't feel myself. So then slowly I started to get, like symptoms of a cold. Guess what? It was spring. So I thought, oh, allergies, Arizona, that happens. And then slowly became worse and worse. So then I decided to uh, put a lock together. Every four hours, I was taking my temperature. And I we purchased an oximeter, which you just uh, basically measures your oxygen uh, in your blood. And then that lock had temperature and oxygen every four hours. And I was taking a lot of medicine, uh, double my vitamin C and all that stuff. So how, if you ask me, how do you feel? As I progress, I'm telling you the day that I had to go to the ER, I had to, it was 3.30 in the morning. I stood up, we were sleeping. I was sound asleep. And then I started coughing and I stood up and I sat and walked towards the hallway and I just dropped on the floor and then start coughing and then trying to breathe and thinking, I have to breathe. I have to breathe. And I started counting my breathing because I was it's hypoxia, what you get, lack of oxygen. And I just was, I, I just didn't want to wake up Gary and say, this is, this is it. I have to, we have to call 911. We have to get to the hospital. So we didn't know what to do. So we, we came downstairs and then I put eucalyptus drops thinking, oh, I'm going to do some inhalations of, of vapor. Well, that's not a good idea because all that water uh, gets into your system and doesn't help to open those bronchiola, what you need to open. So I, we end up going to the hospital. And I'm telling you, those were hours that became like, the, like years for me. Because you have, you know, you breathe and you don't, you don't count uh, on it. You just, it's natural. This was just like, I have to breathe one, two, three, four, inhale. I am a swimmer. So I swim a lot when I was growing up. So I knew my breathing. So I knew how to breathe. But in this case, it was conscious. And I'm telling you, all those people out there, they're talking about, I won't wear a mask. I won't just clean my hands. I'm telling you, they have to go throughout what I went through. It was disconcerting. It was kind of like, I thought about my family my husband, uh, life. I thought about life to a great extent. Luckily, my, uh, like I, I told you, I was a swimmer. My lungs had a, a great capacity of, uh, of oxygen intake. And the nurse told me, the nurse and the uh, nurse practitioner and the doctor came in and they said, we, you have to think that you might have to stay overnight 
and I, I said, we're going to try to put you in oxygen on a ventilator. We have to, you know, we need to work on you. That's what she said. So I said, I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, we may, you may need to get a, 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 in your trachea, get the tube. So that's an induced coma as well. Some other patients, they put me in the COVID section because ER, they split it in two parts. And the part that it was, it was the COVID section. So <clears throat> I was, I fell asleep. I just was there because you don't have enough oxygen. So I just fell asleep. And then I woke up and I couldn't breathe. And I just grabbed uh, whatever button was or whatever thing was. And I just pressed the red button. And that thing was just blinking, blinking, blinking red. No one came because they were busy. And I, guess I just, I don't know how I stood up and I just went to the glass. And then I started banging in the glass and telling the, the, the nurse, I cannot breathe, I cannot breathe. So they all came, code red, whatever is it. And then they gave me a corticoid steroid via IV. My body responded to that like immediately. So in less, in three hours, I was able to breathe again on my own. The doctor said, if you don't bring on your own, we have to put oxygen or we have to get you in the ventilator. But I, I don't know, I called my mom, my sister, called people from office. I cried with a, a coworker because you see, I mean, it's like you see like that's not the end, but you are like getting close to it. It was very concerning, very, very difficult. And <clears throat> from that, that was uh, mid-April, 15 days later, I started to, to have the same symptoms. And then everybody was getting sick. A lot of people they were getting sick. And I told Gary, I don't want to go to the ER. I don't. I honestly don't. So luckily for us, uh, a doctor, a naturopath that we go to is halfway blocked from where we are. So we walked there. And then he said, or we called, of course. And then he said, just come here. We put you in one room on your own. And if needed, we, we call, we call uh, um, 911 so you can get to the, to the, uh, to the emergency room in time. Um, he did the same thing. He gave me the same IV and I was able to like restart. So I had two opportunities about uh, 15 days or 10 days apart when I felt like I couldn't breathe. I, I'm talking to you and I, I'm, I'm energized because I just had my albuterol. Uh, it's my treatment that allows me to expand my lungs. And uh, I would say in about two hours, I will be back down again because I'm recovering there is, uh, I took x-rays yesterday. There's still a cloud over my, it's called a cloud uh, over my lungs, which is the, the area that it was infected. And it's reduced from what it was before, but there's still remainings of it. Sometimes I cough and then, sorry to say this, but there's sputum and phlegm and stuff like that coming out of my mouth uh, and it's gross and all that. But that's what COVID is from someone who I presumptive. Once again, I am presumptive of having it. The doctor said there is a strain of it. That's what they're thinking right now. So they're, wearing, they're waiting for an antibodies test. I had the antibodies test, came back negative because it's not, the accuracy is not where it's supposed to be. So I'm waiting for the next antibodies round. So that's in a nutshell, that's what happened. So, so oh, uh, just one question, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so just for everyone you know, who thinks maybe it's not such a huge deal, this started for you March, uh, March 15th was when I first started to have, I, at first I thought it was allergies, March 15th, just about March 12th, March 15th. And today is June 19th. Correct. And that is how long you have been fighting it. And I still have, I believe, 15 days to go. And what, I'm, what I have right now is just this fatigue, this incredible fatigue. And I don't have pain in my lungs anymore or joints or muscle joints but I have a fatigue. I just took a nap. I, I did my treatment. Uh, no, I took a nap, did my treatment. I'm with you here in about two or three hours. I just, I'll be like wipe out again, just ready to go to bed. I've, I've been sleeping a lot, put a lot of weight, <laughs> COVID weight. No kidding. I'm not the only one I think, but, but um, yeah. So yeah, that's the story for everyone. Uh, people out there who think that it's just like, oh, it's not me, it's for somebody else, uh, someone that is immuno immunodepressant uh, or it has some, some other condition. <laughs> I am completely healthy. I went to the doctor actually December and luckily she ran x-rays. My, my, so then there's the x-rays from December and the, my, my, my long x-rays from December and my long x-rays from uh, March 
uh, 30th or 31st. And then you can see the difference. I've been trying through social media to do interviews like this. It's like fourth or fifth that I give to tell people that uh, uh, it's a matter of consciousness. I mean, it's not because you are elderly or you are old or because uh, you have some sort of other type of illness. This will happen to you. This will happen to you because that's the way the illness is. You have to try to keep yourself apart from people, you know, cover your mouth, all those things that, that we all know. Just try not to get it because you don't know how your body's going to react. Carly, I, I cut you off. You know, no, you know, yeah, that's fine. Well, Oscar, you actually answered my question. I was, you know, I was going to say with, with Arizona numbers, you know, just going up more and more and more and, you know, being the hotbed now, I was just going to say, if you were running sort of the marketing campaign to get people to wear masks out in public, you, you know, what would you say? Because there's so many, I feel like the people that will be kind, perfect. Yeah. And that's I mean, the message. And that's my message. I, I found this online. And this is all you need to know is humanity, compassion, and for the good of others. Take your, uh, political statements out, take you uh, out, of the, out of the conversation, uh, find center in uh, humanity, uh, in the good of humans, in the good of Americans. Um, I love this country, I became a citizen and I just love the concept, the concept of America. And it's the land where we can be free, we all can do whatever we want and where we all take care of each other. I've been working actually with someone uh, about uh, in, in something like marketing campaign, we have to go back to the lemonade stand in your neighborhood, the person that moved next to you and you bake a pie and knock on the door, uh, to open the door for others, to wear a mask because it's not about you, it's about the person that perhaps will, will, will get sick, to, to, uh, to help someone, I mean, to help someone to pick up something from the floor when they drop it. The, all these elements of humanity, they're all like all gone or they're not present because we became about me, myself and I, and because everything is selfies on me, myself, my world, the music that I like, we forgot who, completely about the other person, completely about your neighbor, the person across the street next to you. You know, when someone leaves the garage open, you just knock on your door. Hey, by the way, you left the garage open or the, what, your water is running and stuff like that. It's like, no, that's not my matter. This is my problem. So it's going back to those famous values, the, the values, the values that makes us unique and makes us human. That's my message. And I think I've been wearing this and I know I got the looks. I went to the doctor. I ventured for the first time in three months yesterday to go out and I was wearing my mask. I just, whatever, it's not a confrontation. This is a statement. It's not up for discussion. That's it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get into an argument with you if you stop me or whatever. No, nope, that's it. That's what I think it is. How did it? How did it feel going out after so long of quarantine? Scary. Yeah. I have to tell you, scary because for many reasons. One, um, if is the famous trust. This was. It's like when you start dating someone, and you're like, I know you're dating me. And you're not going out with anybody else because, because we talk about this. Uh, or when you start working f uh, or going to an interview and you're like, well, they told me they're going to hire me. You know, it's kind of like that doubt that is in your mind. That's how I felt yesterday. Like I felt cheated on the people that didn't have it. I felt like I'm wearing it, not because of me, because I passed through all that. And luckily I'm recovering. It's because perhaps I can transmit it again to you or you can pass it on to your grandma that is at home or to your kid or someone in your family who's sick. Or if, you're, if your heart is in your pocket, then that worker that you need in your office or your work is gonna get busy, is gonna get sick, and then you're, you're busy now, you won't, you won't be busy, your business will go to hell. So, so my point is like, it's just a matter of protection. This is a, a shield. We don't know much about all these. We don't know if this is for what we know and, and science says that this is the way to, to prevent it. Uh, or to stop the spread, why not using it? Why do we have to question so much or become a, a political, sorry to say this, I just don't wanna say it, but I will, 
<clears throat> nicely. <laughs> Why do you have to be on a political stand and a podium where you, the, the, the matter is not yours? You are not running for anything. You are not doing anything for the community. The day that you turn your actions uh, or your verbs into action, then you have a place to say. Right now, you're just another citizen. And all, the only thing you have is your vote. And if you want to help this to, to move forward, you have to vote or convince other people to vote for the person and the, and the party that you think is good for all of us. Um, but right now, all you have is, as a, as a citizen, is just the ability to help others. And if this is a matter and this is a way to help others, why not do it? Why do you have to ask so much? And I, we have a little bit of time left and it's, there's one story I just wanna see if you'll tell for us. You, it's Pride Month and mm -hmm. you have maybe one of my favorite wedding stories of all time. <laughs> can you can you just tell us the, you know, you don't have to go into all of it if you want, okay. but the story of you and your husband getting married is, it's epic and it's it's beautiful. And so I just think it's a great message for us to share. Thank you. You can go to, you can find all the information, uh, um, get, uh, oscarandgary.com. I think we still have the website or you can go to YouTube, it says Oscar and Gary wedding. And so you can find what it was. So what happened is that we were not able to get married in Arizona um, uh, five, uh, five years ago. Um, and then uh, California strikes the, uh, the ban on same-sex marriage. And then I told Gary, let's go, let's go get wed. So we went to Coronado. Well, we just like, let's not, why not go? So we went to Coronado, a friend of ours, found a location, found, found the place that we wanted to do it in Santa Barbara. It was too expensive. We ended up going to Coronado. Uh, and then we thought, why don't we do it in a public park? Um, and then it's a, it's a centennial park that overlooks Coronado Bay. Um, um, sorry, San Diego Bay is beautiful. So we decided to do the wedding outdoors with 28 of our friends. So they all came to Coronado. Uh, the wedding is happening. There's a series of buildings running parallel that frame the view of San Diego. So through in the middle of the wedding, I actually was giving my vows or one of us, I think it was Gary, I can't remember. We didn't have video, we had photography. Um, in one of the balconies, uh, like perhaps the balcony that you see we have here at home, there is this guy in his balcony screaming the worst words you could ever imagine um, loud to us. It was someone who was homophobic, had uh, couldn't tolerate what was happening in front of them, et cetera, et cetera. So we, I wanted to walk and just say whatever, you know, words I need to confrontate, uh, kind of confrontational situation. And then Gary pulled me in, we, we went on, et cetera, et cetera. So that's fine. The uh, ceremony happens, we end up going to the reception. Next day we go for breakfast and then the waiter in San Diego tells us, what are you guys doing here? And then we told him about the wedding and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry for what happened to you guys. And I'm like, what? You guys already know what happened? And then Gary's like, what? Yeah, you guys got, sorry, some guys start screaming and so on and so forth. And then <clears throat> I told Gary, we need to do something. This is just awful. So we went to the city of Coronado. We did all this stuff um, that you do regularly. You know, you go to the city. Hey, by the way, look, you have a homophobic. Who knows if that guy had a gun? We could have been killed, et cetera, et cetera. So they didn't do anything. So Gary flies to Europe. I stay in town. He goes, hits the news uh, everywhere around the world of what happened. Gary sees an article. Uh, he's landing in London and he sees an article of us, the Daily Mail. We are in the front on the cover, the, like the two of us, homophobic slurs, uh, same-sex wedding, uh, Coronado. So, um, so we wrote, Gary wrote uh, and kind of like a, an article, if you would, an op, op, op ed article. So then um, it got published and it went viral everywhere. So anyway, the story goes that the city of Coronado throws a second wedding, everything paid. We fly back to Coronado. We get the city's, the city's uh, key, the key of the city by the mayor. The mayor was the person who did the entire wedding. Uh, we got, oh my God, it's just crazy. 300 people that we didn't know. We love them to pieces. The party was crazy. So yeah, so there's videos and stuff. You can Google it and find out. And there's some stories coming. We're, we're working with a producer uh, trying to produce uh, either a documentary or some sort of film. Uh, so we hope Eva Spaniard is watching. Hi. So hopefully that's going to happen. And it's going to be a pleasure to, to leave a mark of what was our story. 
So, so just to be clear, the city threw you a second wedding where four the- ladies, four ladies that were part of the city, they just basically put together a Facebook page and they said like, no, 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 that's not how we do things in Coronado. How is that possible? In our, like, like, like I was telling you, that's the humanity. How can you do things like that? You don't like, yell at two guys, even if they're gay, whatever, in the middle of the wedding. You don't do that. So then these ladies took upon themselves to, to create a Facebook page. And then they asked people to donate, to throw us, to do something, you know, uh, to do some sort of celebration for us. And then they invite us back. The little celebration became, it was supposed to be just a bonfire by the beach, just all, all of us and the four ladies, you know, the four ladies, their husbands and whatever. Became a wedding for 300 people with limos and spas and hotel and like Gary and I, they even opened a GoFundMe account and they raised money. And then Gary, for our honeymoon, because we were going, we wanted to go to, what are we going? I can't remember. Anyway, so we actually, Gary and I talked and it's like, nope, we don't want the money. We're going to give them the money so they can create some sort of scholarship and teach their kids and their people that things like this, situations like this shouldn't happen and you shouldn't do things like that. So we gave them the, the funds and then they opened a scholarship and they are, they've done several things with it uh, in their name, Oscar and Gary in Coronado. It's a beautiful thing. It's like, that's, what I, that's what my heart gets so big, uh, emotional heart is because we can do things like this, like, like what happened to us is a good example of, of, of kindness, of humanity, of solidarity. And then we should be doing that right now. We should get together rather than pull apart. It feels like the, like the world's coming to an end. You turn on the TV, the country's coming to, like, this is the end of it. No, 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 we still have ourselves. We still have our kindness. This is the time to pull together, the time to talk to your neighbor, the, the time to find out what is the problem um, that you can solve at your level with your funds. Beautiful. I know it's gorgeous. Sorry, it feels like I'm running for pre I'm running here for president. You, uh, no, you, you, and you. I'll vote for you. I mean, that's the thing. After all that, like, yeah, yeah. same. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just like. But think about it. If I, you know, if I knock on your door and I tell you, Sean. I'm, I feel sick. Uh, I, I need to go to the hospital. You're like, okay, yep, let's go. It's like, you know what? Let me call 911. You take care of yourself. I, I just lock my door. I, I don't trust you. So that's the, uh, we have the, cap the capability of making that, that immediate connection with what is good and what is bad, what is human and what is not. So uh, what, like you can trust a person or you can't, you know? Uh, uh, Will Smith, uh, you know, singer, uh, wrote or tweet because that's the new, the, the new books that we're reading these days. It's all social media. We don't read uh, uh, printed books anymore. But Will Smith said, racism still exists. The thing is that it's getting taped, it's getting filmed. So with our phones, we're able to film what is happening. So, so with all these, what I tried to say is, is like, we are seeing we're we're at home going through COVID and then through the TV on our screens, in our phones, we're seeing what's happening out there. That's the rage. We have now the time to think about of where we are as a community. This was happening, but now we have the time to see all this. So, so um, it's more like a reflection. I think so if we take those that information and we make it a reflection of, of being better, doing better, we will go through all this together. Yeah, yeah. Four more years, four more years. That's all I say to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. But um, you know, it's like you have uh, this channel, you guys have this voice, and I'm very glad that you invited me. Um, I've, like I said, I've done other interviews similar to this, and that's my message. My message is not, uh, my message is more to unify, to, be, to, be, to create solidarity and, and kindness amongst your friends and, and your networks. Yeah, perfect, gorgeous. Thank you, my friend, for coming on. Thank you for sharing two you. such heartfelt thank stories. Thank um, you, thank you. Oh, oh. <laughs> as the dogs arrive, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Thank yeah. you so much once again. Excellent, all right, thank you. Love you guys. Love you, bye -bye. talk to you later. Ciao, ciao, bye. Um, well, Hello. another That's fantastic show. Oh my gosh, so yeah. at the end. Um,
I forgot to get the word from him, but it, it, you know, who- you Kindness, can't... solidarity, humanity, pick that's, one. He said so many of them. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, just to let people know for next week, we have Megan Carney, who is the artistic director of About Face Theater, which is one of the leading LGBT theaters in the country, if not the leading. Uh, and Amy Young for in Phoenix with Chicago Magazine or with Echo Magazine to be here. And uh, we'll be thrilled to have them on talking about things that are going on. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. Thank you, Carly, for being thank the co-host. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And we will see you all next week on Hang and Focus Live. You are. You are. You are. I am. I am. I am. I am. We are. We are. We are. We are. Arizona. Theater. Arizona Theater Company. This podcast was produced by Arizona Theater Company.